It's 20 years since the velvet flooded over the golden spires of Prague and draped Czechoslovakia in a bloodless revolution. In the aftermath of the fall of communism came the adventurous. Backpackers, hippies, hedonists, artists, musicians, actors and the curious. All gagging for a taste of that infamous bohemian lifestyle. This influx of minds, coupled with the total freedom a post-revolution city ensured, led to Prague being labelled the left bank of the 90s. One man did more to put this title in its place than any other. On the anniversary of the 20th year since the fall of communism in Czechoslovakia, I caught up with Canadian and legendary publican Glenn Emery. We talked about Glenn's new book, Thirsty Dogs, which for the first time lifts the lid on what it was really like during the 90s in Prague. So, Glenn, um, tell me about your new book and why you decided to write it. Uh, well, because the the you know a number of reasons. I mean, I mean, I thought it would be good to you know after being here for 20 years, it'd be good to have something to take away from Prague other than just a beer belly, a hair loss problem, and a and a huge hangover. You know, so. Uh, um, and it's just a, it's sort of a, it's a big historical period, you know the, 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 the you know the post communist the fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Iron Curtain, and um, and a, there was a bunch of us who came here right after the, the these events, these historical European events, or world events, I guess, and um, and we uh, we we came here. We start we started a lot of the businesses that became really famous and. Um, and uh, created a scene that was became internationally famous, was spoken about in the international press, in the media, and um, all sorts of interesting people came through over the years. It was a really, really fun, interesting, exciting, dynamic time. And I had all these stories that I've been retelling for years, and um, and um, and so um, I've actually tried a few times to sit down and, and put put the, the the story onto paper. And I was having such a hard time with it that I left it two or three times. I tried and just left it. And but then uh, one day I was um, in a pub with a bunch of friends who just sort of ended up. We all ended up there by accident. Just to, just uh, there was like ten of us, and um, we were all all people from that era. Maybe a couple of newer people. And we were telling stories, and then uh, I, and somebody reminded me of a story, so I told a story, and I had to go to the toilet, and I was trying to get to the end of the story so I could, you know, have a break and, and go to the toilet. And I finished my story, and everybody was laughing so hard, and I was laughing, and I went to the toilet, and I was standing there at the urinal, and I was looking at the wall, and I was thinking, well, hell, if you can if you can um, write down the story the way you just told it in the pubs in a pub setting, and made everybody piss themselves laughing, then uh, you're onto something. So uh, I went home that night, in fact after a few more beers and I tried to write down that story that I told and uh, the next morning I I opened up my computer and um, and read it back to myself and it uh, it actually read quite well and it was funny you know even on paper it was funny and it worked and so I just started um, I just started uh, compiling these these stories and um, I got about 60 now and I've uh, and made it sort of a collection of short stories. There's no, there's no nothing really tying the stories together at all. It's just a collection of short stories, pub stories that I've been retelling for years and years. So, having read some of your book, um, how do you think the reaction will be to, to your candid and honest appraisal of what I would describe as the Wild West years here? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that, uh, I think that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I am candid and maybe a little irreverent, um, but I think that also the reader, the reader appreciates. I mean, as I, as a reader, I appreciate when somebody's being honest, and I'm trying to be as honest as possible. And one of the ways that I <coughs> that, that I um, overcame this this uh, this notion that maybe I should uh, watch what I say was uh, was uh, <laughs> the first the first thing that I said to myself was well my mother is not going to read this so uh, I put that in the back of my head and then I then I, I I basically wrote everything down the way it was and um, um, and and yeah I might be politically incorrect and I might be saying some things that'll piss some people off but you know if I drop off a few people's Christmas lists, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not going to cry about it. And the, and the main thing is is that is that, uh, is that if if you can't be true to the you know you got to be true to the story, and um, otherwise it comes across as um, as um, being a bunch of bullshit, you know. 
So, um, the name of the book is Thirsty Dog. Uh, where does the name come from? Is it f from your uh, appetite of Czech ale or, or <laughs> what? It's uh, Thirsty Dogs and um, one of the subtitles is uh, The Left Skank of the 90s. Um, it comes from uh, one, one of the bars that we, one of the pubs that we owned in, in the Obetsny Doom, in the Municipal House of Prague, which is this um, beautiful, huge uh, Art Nouveau building on Republic Square in the Old Town. Uh, we ended up taking over the left-hand side of it for about two years and ran it and ran clubs and pubs and bars and restaurants and cafes and it was this huge complex, crazy. And it was sort of like the cornerstone of the whole that whole um, early 90s euphoric, you know, sort of, uh, uh, era was, was all centered around that place. And uh, around the back there was a pub called the Formanka, which we took over. And one of the guys who was working for us, Joe Earlywine, who we called Joey Knuckles, because he used to be a boxer, um, he, uh, he, uh, he called it the Thirsty Dog. And uh, we just said, that's fine, that sounds like a good name to us. And, uh, and then subsequently, a few months after we opened it, we opened, that was the first place we opened, I think. We opened that, and then we opened the cafe, and then we opened the club. But the, the Thirsty Dog was opened first because it was pretty much ready to go. We just built a bar and put in some taps, and, and it was done. Uh, yeah, and after about three or four months, uh, Nick Cave showed up in town and was, uh, was playing the back-to-back -back gigs at the Lucerna because he sold out the first one, so we played a second one. In, in the Lucerna Music, or in the Lucerna Big Hall, in fact, which must hold 4,000 or 5,000 people. And, um, and, and for the whole two or three, four days that he was in town, he was drinking in the Thirsty Dog. He was just hanging out in the back room there with a few of his pals, getting drunk. And, um, and uh, he ended up writing a song called The Thirsty Dog. And uh, it's all about the, the pub. It talks about the Americans standing at the bar and da-da-da-da. And, um, yeah, and so it, 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 it's... As a title for the book, it's fine because it's you know a lot of the stories are about drinking and about the, the sort of uh, hedonistic hedonistic era in the early '90s, and and that's basically what was going on was a lot of uh, thirsty dogs running around. Um, as you say, the book is a collection of short stories. Do you have a personal favorite story in the book? Actually, yeah, my personal favorite is a story that happened to me in the in the Klondike, and uh, and uh, it it has a connection to Czechoslovakia. And uh, it was just a, it just well, it just a weird weird thing that happened to me, where I I was driving out of the bush and I and I pulled in and we were way out in the bush like 50 kilometers up some dirt road in an old mining district where you had to we had to ford a couple rivers to get out and onto the main highway that goes to Whitehorse, and and the first the first town that we'd pull into was a town called Carmax. And um, it was just a small village, 300 people, plus an Indian reservation on the other side of the river. There was a few more hundred people. And, uh, and I pulled in, because <clears throat> I had to drive south to Whitehorse a couple hundred kilometers, or 150. And I, and I was checking the truck out, because the, 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 the 4 by 4 because it hadn't been, you know, hadn't been out of the bush for a few weeks. So I popped the hood, and I was checking the oils, and I was checking the tires, and pumping the gas, and filling up the tank. And as I was washing the front window, I saw some movement by the tanks, and I was like, I thought somebody was like watching me or spying on me, and I paid no attention. And then I saw it again, and I was like, hang on, there is somebody there. And then I looked, and I said, hello. Then I saw this this guy start to come out from behind the tanks. This really short guy with like a black hat, and and ringlets like this coming out of his hat, and he was wearing a black jack black suit with a white shirt. And as I said, I said hello, and he's like hello. And he started to come out from behind the tank, and as he came out from behind the tank, I saw that he was dressed like this Hasidic Jew, basically. And I'd never ever met, I came from Vancouver, but I'd never ever met any Jewish people before in my life. I'd just you know, seen him on television or something. And all of a sudden, here's, one, here's this guy, and, uh, and I said, hello, and he's like, oh, da, da, and, and uh, you know, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm coming from Mount Nansen, I'm driving into Whitehorse, do some, get, get some supplies, and... And I said, what about you? And he says, oh, I'm just out for a walk. And he had this heavy accent. And, and I turned to him, I said, I said, where are you from, anyways? And he, and he steps up onto the, onto the, the island the, 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 where the gas pumps are. And he, and he sticks out his chest and he says, I am a Czechoslovakian Jew. 
And I thought about it for half a second because I'd lived in Slovakia before and I still spoke some Slovak. And so I said to him very quickly, I said, I said, no, dobrý den, ako sa máte? Like, oh, good day, how are you? And he heard me say this in Slovak, in, in fluent Slovak. And his eyes started to bug out, his lips started trembling. And then he turned around and ran for the trees, you know. <laughs> I guess he thought that so they'd found him after all these years. So, but um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool story.